Okay, good evening, everyone. It's eight o'clock, and so wonderful to see uh, a number of you on already. Um, uh, we're just going to wait another couple minutes as people are uh, are uh, logging in and joining us for our wonderful program tonight with Rabbi Jackter. Uh, we are really, really, really privileged to have him here with us tonight. So just uh, hang tight, everybody, and we'll begin in just a few minutes. Thank you for your patience. And if you just joined us uh, um, in the last uh, moments, uh, we are going to begin just uh, just a short a short while uh, for our program tonight with uh, Rabbi Jackter. And uh, uh, so hang tight; we'll, we'll get going very soon. Thank you.
Okay, good evening, everybody. Let me just uh, remove this from the screen. There we go. And welcome uh, to our uh, to our next installment of this uh, of this program uh, of our Living Torah Fund series. And without further ado, I'm going to uh, to turn it over to Rabbi Morgenstern to introduce our amazing guest speaker tonight, Rabbi Morgenstern. Hello, Hebra. Uh, I am in a, an interesting spot here in the uh, in the community. I'm at Carpenter's Pond. Uh, for those of you who um, know the lay of the land in Scarsdale, but I'll tell you in particular who knows the lay of the land in Scarsdale, and that is Rabbi Chaim Jachter, our uh, scholar in residence uh, this evening, who will be um, presenting to us. I was here because I figured on, you know, I was coming back from a Shiva Minyan and I'm like, you know, probably there's no better place uh, for me to introduce Rabbi Jachter uh, than from this spot, which for many, many years um, was the uh, place where there was, there was an A roof here uh, in Carpenter's Pond, all the way down, down yonder over there before they redid the pond. And it was a place that gave tremendous consternation uh, to myself and others who used to have to check this Eruv through the thickets of poison ivy and poison oak and spider webs and so on and so forth. And one of the early things that I did when I, when I, I became a uh, rabbi, this, I took over as a senior rabbi here in the shul, was I brought in Rabbi Jachter uh, to take a look at this and say, what, what do you think? Do we need an Eruv here anymore? They redid the pond. It's uh, something that contributes to the overall beauty of the, uh, the, the, the town of New Rochelle, of Scarsdale, and based on halachic principle, uh, Rabbi Jachter and those, Rabbi Klinger, they know what I'm talking about here. And Baruch Hashem, Rabbi Jachter uh, said, you know what, we're good. The, the Carpenter's Pond is part of the, the overall aesthetic uh, part of, the, uh, of, of our amazing community. And uh, we are good. The air is all around and we don't have to sort of cordon off this spot uh, that was cordoned off for many years. And Rabbi Jachter has the authority to do that because he is the authority, perhaps the world's authority in Erevin uh, throughout, uh, literally internationally. And he's, he's built dozens and dozens of Erevin all throughout the country. And I know also the world, he consults on Erevin literally throughout the world. Um, he is also a, excuse me, Sorry about that. He's also a, uh, a, a, the, uh, a Dian on the basin of Elizabeth. He is also a world's internationally um, renowned expert. Excuse me. Sorry, one more time. Re internationally renowned expert in uh, Gittin, uh, where uh, he has served really just to help the Jewish people. He's a champion of women's rights as it comes to uh, the Aguna issues and really is just, uh, there are no words. Rabbi Jachter is also available to me and Rabbi Klinger as our community's postache and a, a close personal friend and my, my Rav and my postache. We have relied on him for countless, countless things that we've done in our community and especially throughout the pandemic. Uh, we're talking about 24 seven discussions and relying on his psaac and his incredible wisdom He's a Muslim from uh, Rabbi Isaac Ochanan Theological Seminary from Ritz. He is the Rav of the Sephardic Congregation in Tinek, Sharei Ora, and the head of the uh, Tanakh Department at uh, TABC, at Torah Academy of Burton County, where he teaches uh, as a Magid Shir for many, many years there. And uh, he's written, on his free time, he's written numerous books, dozens and probably hundreds of articles, and it is an absolute kavod and pleasure to have Rabbi Jachter here with us uh, to present to the young Israel of Scarsdale this evening. Kavod harav hachacham. Thank you, Rabbi Morgenstern. Thank you, Rabbi Klinger. And thank all of you for coming. That's very, very kind introductions. Uh, tonight, I want to, I have, it's a unique privilege. It's really, really wonderful for us to, uh, to, to describe the personalities of three outstanding Rabbanim, three great gedolim that, have passed away over the past year. And that is, we're gonna start with Rav Zalman Chemi Goldberg, and then we're gonna continue with Rav Gedaya Schwartz. 
And then we're going to continue with, and, we're gonna, and, and we'll conclude with Rav David Feinstein. But I want to do this in a little bit of an interesting way. What I'd like to do, and Rabbi Klinger, maybe you'll just uh, make sure that uh, we can we can uh, we can do this. I'd like to have a little input from our participants. What I'm going to do is I'd like to show a video of each of these gedolim speaking, and hopefully you'll be able to get just a 30 second snippet of of, of each one. And I'd like the participants perhaps to uh, to per- to identify. A, a little bit of a uh, a little bit of their personalities. I believe even in thirty seconds you can make you can make a pretty good assessment of of these rabbi names. So let's begin now with Rav Zalman Lachemia Goldberg, a great Israeli posik. Let's begin with a uh, thirty seconds of a shear that he uh, that he delivered at Karen Biyadna. Let me bring it up on the share screen. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, one second. No, no, one second. I didn't, I didn't uh, share the sound, sorry. There we go, share sound, and now we're good to go. All right, we're just gonna show 30 seconds of this. Okay, uh, Rabbi Klinger, am I able to see the participants a little bit just for a minute? No? Okay, that's all yeah, right. Yeah, remove the spotlight, and now uh, uh, people can unmute themselves as well. Okay. So, uh, any does anybody have any thoughts about uh, what? What did you? What? What? What sense did you get from from Rav Zalman coming Goldberg from that thirty seconds that you saw him? What impressions did, did anybody ha- get, gain? Any some impressions? That's a shear that he gave about seven years ago. That's at age eighty-two. He's delivering a shear at Karen Biavna. Any impressions that you received from Rav Zalman coming Goldberg? Modest. Yeah. Thank you. Y- y- that's that. Y- 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 you got exactly the point. There's a, there's a tremendous modesty. That, his modesty was un, was 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 legendary. Was, uh, he just would drive the buses. He would, he never took cars. He never it, it just because he he just felt he was a, a, a regular Jew. Oh my goodness, we can go on for hours talking about his modesty. Anybody else? Anybody want else uh, suggest uh, any other um, any other impressions that you received from those thirty seconds? A little thirty second snippet snippet about Rav Zam Nechemi Goldberg. A little bit about him. What did you see in that video? Any any more thoughts? Okay. Oh, here we go. Comfortable with himself. That's that. Thank you. That's another excellent one. Very comfortable with himself. That's right. That's that's huge. That's very huge. I think also a big thing about Rav Zalman Chaim Goldberg, who I had the privilege to spend a lot of time with, is that Rav Zalman Chaimia, was uh, was very his he was very, very psychologically healthy, very very high psychological health. That's a that's a very astute assessment. Good, you picked that up in the thirty seconds. Again, let's see. Any anybody else have any more assessments of what else did you see? What about taking take include the students? What, what did anybody notice the contrast between the students and the Rebbe in that uh, in that in that little in that little snippet? Anybody? And that little conversation, did anybody pick up what was going on there? Anybody want to say? His introduction is giving a shear on Korach from the, from the Seder. The shear was given a few, uh, a few weeks before Pesach. And did anybody catch uh, the beginning of what was going on there? So, okay. So first of all, you saw a Haredi, a Haredi Rav. Clearly a Haredi Rav. You no know, Shari Chesed, Yushalayim, you know, old school. Razam Lechemia. And he... Uh, and, and so he pronounces things. He, was, he wanted to introduce. He's going to speak about the mitzvah of of, of of Korach. And who's he speaking to? He's speaking to he's speaking to uh, Dati Lumi students to a kippah Ruga with a colored shirt. To him, Rav Zam Lachemia, it not, it didn't matter. You're interested in learning Torah. He taught you Torah. You you believe in Torah. He was so above politics. To him, politics was 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 meaningless. 
you love Torah, you respect the Torah. He was he was all in. So he, he was at Shalvim, he was at he was at Karmiyavna, along with the with the Hasidish, with the Hasidish at Machon Lev, along with the Hasidish of Bate, Bate Midrash, in addition to being a Dayan, just a, 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 a Dayan within the Rabbanut system, an extraordinary, extraordinary person. Anybody catch the beginning when he starts introducing the mitzvah of Karach? He called it Kairach, Kairach. Now, <laughs> he's a, yeah, that's, that's the way he pronounced it, the way in his milieu in, in, in the Shari Chesed neighborhood of Yerushalayim. But, if, uh, but, but then the students didn't understand what he was talking about. He realized that in a second, and he, and he picked it up and he said, Korech. So he, he changed it for the, uh, for the uh, Dati Lil Me, for, for the religious Zionist audience, so they'd be able to understand it. And he launched into the Shir, and he adjusted for the uh, for, for the religious Zionists, for the Israeli pronunciation. Beautiful. This just uh, you get a, a little bit of a sense of what a uh, of, of what a, of what an extraordinary uh, extraordinary beautiful person. You also see the you got a little bit of a sense as young people that are hanging on his every single word. There's a tremendous, brilliant, utterly brilliant. I just will give you. I want to capture his brilliance in a in a in a, in a few um, very uh, in a few rulings that he gave, and then I want to capture it, and then we'll focus on what he's what he's most famous for. Just one uh, one interesting one, a very important ruling that he gave was about copyright. You know, every once in a while you'll hear people making the claim that oh yeah, the halacha doesn't have anything to say about copyright. Not so. Rav Zamnachemia. Rav Zamnachemia said no. Look at the concept of shiur. You find this in the Gemara all the time. That way, that uh, that you uh, in, in a sale that the, the, the that the seller has the has the right to retain to retain uh, certain rights over the uh, over over the over the item that he sells. He, he will he'll retain a partial ownership. So, for example, the Gemara in the third parak of Bab Masia speaks about if you sell a uh, if you, you sell sheep but still retain the rights to its wool, you all have you retain a partial ownership of the wool. So, what's a What's uh, what's a similar idea? What's that have to do with copyright? Said Rav Zalman Chaimi, it's exactly the same thing. It's perfect, the perfect, perfect analogy that the seller is selling the rights to use the copyrighted material, except for the uh, for the purpose of uh, violation of the uh, of the copyright. That's uh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful analogy. But of course, what's Rav Zalman Chaimi most most famous for in the United States and in the modern Orthodox community of the United States is that Rav Zalman Chaimi Goldberg developed. In the early 90s, together with Rav Mordechai Willig of Riverdale, he developed the Rabbinical Council of America prenuptial agreement, which has since, which has been very implemented, it's become very, very popular. I'm sure Rabbi Morgenstern and Rabbi Klinger insist on it at every at, at, at every at every wedding that they officiate. I insist on every wedding that I, that I officiate, and so do at this point most members of the, of the Rabbinical Council of America. And this prenuptial agreement has, to a great extent, has 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 eliminated has has almost eliminated almost eliminated the 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 scourge of aggravated igun from the modern Orthodox community. It's just it's just incredible. It's a sea change. The, literally, the, the the prenuptial agreement is it, it, that Rav Zalman Goldberg introduced uh, and had a, a, approval of other great gedolim like Rav Avadji Yosef has made an incredible impact in our community. There's, there, there, there are major Igun problems in other Orthodox communities, but Bar Hashem, with, with uh, it's, it's, it's very much under control in, uh, in, in our, in, in our community. Not a perfect situation, but uh, what, what a difference the prenuptial agreement made. What a d- dramatic difference. Now, here's the question: Why is it that Rosam Lachemi Goldberg was able to find a solution to this in the early '90s, despite the fact that for decades, decades? Oh, we were the, the Orthodox rabbis were looking for what, what kind of what kind of a prenuptial agreement could we formulate? Looking, 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 searching, formulating, weren't weren't coming up with anything. Despite we had Rav Soloveitchik, we had Rav Moshe Feinstein. What what are, what's Rav, what's it about Rav Zalman Chaim Goldberg that he came up with a solution? Two things. First of all, he's an active dying sitting on the base in in Yerushalayim. For uh, see, see, he sees the cases, he sees the situations. He's, he's very familiar with the re, with the reality of 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 Igun, confronting it every single day in the in in, in the rabbanut in the Israeli government official Bate Din official rabbinic courts. That's number one. But number two, and this goes to his personality, Rav Zalman Goldberg was very much about solutions, 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 solutions. This was to him 
he was, you know, to, he, to him he saw pro- there was a problem. He want, he he tried as best as he can to find solutions to it. Not always he find to, to find the solutions, but but often you do. And and he really hit a home run as far as the as as far as the as as far as as far as the RCA prenuptial agreement. Let me share with you a uh, an incident that uh, that happened in the basin that I that I witnessed in uh, in the summer of 1993. This was uh, this was a dramatic moment. Uh, this is actually not too long after he introduced the prenuptial agreement in the uh, in the United States with uh, the Rabbinical Council of America and with Mordecai Willig that there was an activist uh, divorce attorney in the in the basin and he and he uh, a couple came to that and a couple came to Rav Zamakami and the other two in his basin for a for to for a cedar I get for uh, for a get for uh, to, to administer a get and uh, they previously had had concluded their monetary agreement in the in the civil court and the basin was reviewing the monetary agreement and lo and behold Rav Zamakami Goldberg discovered that the attorney, the activist uh, attorney, had introduced the following clause in their divorce agreement that the couple agreed as follows. Listen to this. This is a self style This is a homemade prenuptial agreement that this uh, that this attorney made. I to be an, or- an Orthodox woman, nice woman. I got I got to meet her uh, afterwards informally, and she uh, she she she. But she came up with an idea that uh, not 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 very sophisticated, which said like this. She had them. The, she, her, her idea was as follows. Not halakhically sophisticated. That she that she, that she said that uh, th- that the the, uh, the the couple agree as follows that if the man doesn't give the get he he loses his half his share in the marital home the wife refuses to receive a get she refuses she she forfeits her right her half of the marital marital home now that's a that's a serious issue because that that creates monetary coercion to for the man to give the get and woman receive the get neither one can be coerced so he felt that's illicit coercion well he has his case in front of him in the bathing as i said Rav Zaman Kami goldberg was all about solutions 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 so what was the solution so he brilliantly and it's very quick i couldn't believe how quickly he came he just immediately came up with the following solution he said i this is what, you, this is what you're going to do you're going to you're going to formulate an agreement that says as follows, and they agreed to it. They agreed to it right there, right there and then. This this all happened within about ten minutes, maybe less. That they agreed, they agreed. Number one, not to uh, not, not not to activate this this clause in their divorce agreement, and two, that if they activate this uh, this clause, they agree to indem- indemnify the other. In other words, if the if they uh, if the if the if the wife's not receiving the get, and the husband's now going to pressure agrees that if he, that uh, if he tries to 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 uh to uh to, to activate this clause that he will have to indemnify her for for all the money that he would receive so therefore what he's doing is he's neutralizing it he wasn't able to in the rabbinic court he wasn't able to neutral he wasn't able to eliminate the agreement that was made in the israeli civil court but what he's able to do, he's able to neutralize. Brilliant. And of course, I realized after, after uh, uh, the, the, the Purim afterwards, I, I realized, oh, that's, what was, that's where Zalman Lechemi got the idea. <laughs> Does anybody know? Anybody want to give it a, give it a shot in the chat? Where in Megillah says did Zalman Lechemi get, Goldberg get this idea that you have, if you have a decree that you can't overturn, that, you, uh, that creates a problem, that you, uh, you, 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 uh, you neutralize it? What was the idea? Where did he get this idea? He, he pulled the same idea as Mordechai and Esther. What did Mordechai and Esther do? Right? They had a decree from, uh, from, from Haman to exterminate the Jews. Couldn't, over, couldn't overturn it. So what did Rav <laughs> He took the same idea. You can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't overturn it, but you can neutralize it. That's exactly what Mordechai has to do with the second decree, neutralizing Haman's decree. Anyone tries to activate Haman's decree can be, uh, can, can be killed. And they lose it and they forfeit all their money. So there's a, a, a similar idea. Again, just wanted to give I, I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense uh, of the uh, a really a, a very very brilliant of uh, Rav Zalman Lechemia. I wanted just I just wanted to end on my my discussion of Rav Lechemia is just to show just a, a funny story, um, but it really reflects how much he loved family. He loved he adored his family. He adored his family. And it's interesting. Razam Lachemi Goldberg has a cousin that some of you may know. I imagine that in that in uh, that in the young Israel scars that you have many families that uh, that are involved with Ramaz. Now, the longtime school psychologist at 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 Ramaz is Dr. Jerry Zaitchik, who is a childhood friend of mine. 
And uh, having to see him the Friday before I was traveling to Israel in our local uh, grocery store on uh, Avenue L and East 56th Street in, uh, in, in, in back in Brooklyn, where we uh, were both grew up. And, uh, and I mentioned to him that uh, right after Shabbos, Shabbos, a late flight, I'm going to be flying to Israel. I'm going to be sitting with Zalman Mechani Goldberg, watching him, uh, uh, watching him preside over this basin for, uh, for, 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 a, for, a, uh, for, 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 uh, for a few weeks. And he said to me, are you kidding? That's tell, telling you're my cousin. Tell me you're my, I'm telling you you're my friend, you know, because I'm his cousin. I'm his cousin. He's, I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And I told Razam Lechemi that I'm Yochran Zaitchik's uh, friend. Oh, you should have seen his eyes lit up by, uh, he, he was more, I, when I told him I'm a, ta, I'm a Talmud, of Rav, Rav Willig, Rav Goldberg, you know, you know, I said, okay. But when I told him I'm a friend of, of a good friend and neighbor of, of, of Dr. Jerry Zaitchik, that's what uh, really excited him, and I, I think really helped forge a, a, a very special bond between me and Rav Zam uh, and uh, and what I got, why I got a chance to really very extremely generous with the time that he gave me. He answered dozens and dozens of my questions, uh, both in person when I called him. Uh, you know, again, what I said, he's not just a brilliant man, but a beautiful person, a beautiful, a great human being, a great Jew. Adkan for Rav Razam Lechemia. Now let's move on to Rav Gedalia Schwartz. Now before I introduce, uh, before I begin talking about Rav Gedalia Schwartz, I understand one of our friends is going to introduce and make a little bit of an introduction uh, about, uh, about Rav Gedalia Schwartz and his impact on the community of the young Israel of Scarsdale. Uh, good evening, distinguished uh, rabbis and friends. It is my honor to speak to you tonight and give you a different perspective on the impact Rabbi Gedalia Dov Schwartz of Front of Bracha had on, our, on the Jewish community. Rabbi Schwartz was one of the POSECs for the Community Security Service, also known as CSS, which I have been a member of since 2012. CSS was formed in 2007 by 10 vo volunteers, all in their 20s, who saw the need to protect uh, against threats at Jewish events. As the Jewish community saw a rise in anti-Semitism and looked for a solution to better protect themselves, CSS opened their doors to synagogues throughout New York and New Jersey. In order for CSS to prepare to operate properly in shuls, the organization needed the backing of rabbis to allow the, them to perform their jobs of protecting the community. In 2011, the CSS leadership presented themselves to Rabbi Gedalia Dov Schwartz and explained that the equipment needed to operate properly that halakhically would not normally be permitted on Shabbos or Yom Tov, including the radios you see us using. <clears throat> Rabbi Schwartz was one of the rabbis that granted that heter to CSS, stating, considering the serious nature of safety precautions that we all see at airports, courthouses, and public buildings, the threat to human life is very real. In Shulchan Orech, Hilcha Shabbos, it states that where there is a real intent to harm people, it is halakhically permissible to, to assume all precautions necessary to thwart any attacks, even if it means violating Hilcha Shabbos. That was back in 2011. And since that time, situation has not improved. In fact, hate crimes against Jewish entities has uh, increased excuse me, uh, substantially over the years. The ADL reported over 2,100 hate crimes nationwide in 2019. That, the most recent ones known were the Tree of Life Synagogue attack in Pittsburgh in 2018, and the two attacks in December of 2019, Hanukkah night in Muncie, and the shooting in the uh, grocery store in Jersey City. When Rabbi Schwartz understood, what Rabbi Schwartz understood was that the law enforcement agencies could not be everywhere and that it was up to the community to protect themselves. That is what CSS is all about, protecting the Jewish people and the Jewish way of life. Without Rabbi Schwartz, CSS would not have been able to train and grow to over 5,000 Jewish volunteers ranging in ages from 18 to 80. CSS has expanded outside of New York, New Jersey, areas not, uh, area, and now operates in over 50 shoes. <clears throat> in over 10 states from coast to coast, including Connecticut, Massachusetts, Washington, DC, North Carolina, Denver, Seattle, Phoenix, and LA. Communities where CSS operates confidently could go to Dobbin every Shabbos and Yom Tov, knowing that there's always a set of eyes watching and protecting them, potentially saving hundreds if not thousands of lives. I am not the everyday Talmudic student, but Rabbi Schwartz's ruling has had an impact, a major impact on my daily life. For the last nine years because of him, I've had the privilege of being part of CSS, not only as a member, but as a trainer, reaching hundreds of, hundreds of volunteers around the country to keep our schools safe. 
I want to believe that Rabbi Schwartz used CSS as a vessel to allow prayer, learning, and Kiddush, uh, Jewish community life to safely grow, to be a Kiddush Hashem around the United States. With Hashem's help, the legacy of Rabbi Gedalia Do Schwartz will live on as CSS continues to grow and make each and every Jewish community safe from the threats and allow us to dive in with the COVID needed to make the world a better place for all. Thank you. Back to you, Rabbi. Okay, now I'd like to uh, to, to share a little bit of a snippet of about a 30, maybe 30 seconds from uh, from Rav Gedalia Do Schwartz. Let me bring that up. Here we go. And here we go. Let's uh, let's share the screen. I got the share scan on, and here we go. Thirty seconds from uh, about Rav Zam, uh, from uh, from Rav Gedalia Schwartz. And take a guess how old he is as he's delivering this talk. This is two thousand sixteen. Here we go. Just like you have to learn all aspects of Torah, whether it's the different aspects of law, whether it's in the laws of uh, civil law, of Isha's matrimonial law, or the daily conduct of a Jew every day. However, he says that it's essential as part of Torah to know this chain of Messiah from the beginning all the way, all the way what the Rambam describes from the time of Kabbalah's Torah through the time of the Siyum, of the conclusion of the Talmud Babli Rabbeinu Rabashi. It's not just a historical. Okay, so let's get some impressions. What do we think? Let's go back on the chat. What do we think of, what impressions do you get? 30 seconds, little snippet there. Let's hear some impressions you thought of, you received about Razam, of, of, of Rav Gedalia Dov Schwartz. Let's hear some thoughts. Let's hear some thoughts. Let's, let's bring it up in the chat. What did, you, what did you get? Now, first of all, how old was he? Anybody catch? How old, how old do you think he was when he made that presentation in 2016? How old do you think he was? Any thoughts? How old? You think it was energetic? You think he was, it was an energetic presentation? I was an energy, very, he was, in, he was passionate, very energetic. Now how old he was in that presentation? 91, 91 years old, remarkable. 91 years old, and he's able to give, to give a, a prison, a halavai by all of us at 91 years old. We should be able to give such an, an energetic presentation. Beautiful. Reminds of Moshe Rabbeinu, it says towards the, the end of his life, that his, that his, his vigor didn't, didn't stop even towards the end of his life. It's remarkable, remarkable. That 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 sheer that that with a little snippet was only and only a, a year before the devastating stroke that he experienced in in 2017. But until that stroke, he was active and active and strong, and uh, that's why it was so devastating. Of course, to him and his family, but of course to to us as a community to to uh, to to uh, that Rav Zam, that uh, that Rav Gedalia Dov Schwartz could not be as active as he was. Uh, before and we weren't we didn't have the access for all these unbelievable rulings and unbelievable rulings that we were. Rav Gedalia Dov Schwartz was the posek of last resort. For him, for Rav Gedalia Dov Schwartz, he could have had a sign in front of his desk the same as, as Harry Truman. Harry Truman, the sign in front of his desk was the buck stopped here. And same thing with Rav Gedalia Dov Schwartz, the buck stopped here. He took responsibility for, for every major decision within our community. Just, uh, just, a few ex just a few examples, the prenuptial agreement, he ratified the prenuptial agreement, gave it a full, in, full ringing endorsement. He, the 9-11 Agunot, how does the, the solution to all to, 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 uh, to, to 11 cases that he, that, uh, that, he, that, he, that he oversaw, 11 cases. That's Rav, Rav, Rav Gedalia Dov Schwartz. And you know, Rav Gedalia Dov Schwartz did so many of these things out of the public limelight. Now, if you ask, typically, are you, you, the typical modern Orthodox member, they'll, they'll probably heard of Rav Herschel Schechter, probably heard of, 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 of Rav Willig, Rav Schwartz, very likely they didn't hear about him because he was on the quiet. I'll give you an example. After I wrote the article that, uh, that, that, I, that I sent over to Rav Klinger and to, and to Steve, 
I, I, a number of people in, in our uh, Kila, in our congregation, had, had, had mentioned to me, well, we never heard of Rosh Schwartz. Can you, how did he impact us? How did he impact our Kila? So <laughs> I, I, I gave, I, I responded to him. He did. He gave a, first of all, I knew that he, he, he conducted the conversion of a mother of one of our members. And uh, I didn't want I didn't want to say I couldn't say who it was, and I also knew I also I also kn knew and know of course that uh, that he helped someone in our community who had a very serious personal status question, very serious personal status question, and he and he gave a, a warm ruling, a very a very helpful, incredibly helpful ruling. So the people in our in our, con our congregants asked me, well, tell me what it was, tell me what it was. So I said, I can't, it'll violate privacy. I just can't, I can't tell you what it is. I, I, I felt like, the, like you know, the old joke about the rabbi who, uh, who uh, was, uh, was inappropriately went to play golf on, on Yom Kippur. And he hit a goal and he hit a hole in one and he can't tell anybody about it. It's so unbelievable that he did it, but he can't, but he can't tell anybody. So Rav Gadaya Dov Schwartz did so many incredible things, but they were on the QT. They were quiet, and and we're not able and we're not able to not able to tell not able to tell everybody. But that's that's who he was. He was for us the Rabbanim here in the United States. Our most difficult, our most trying issues. We we like like CSS. This is this is, Rav Gadaya Dov Schwartz took it. He embraced it. And, and, and he ran with it. Yeah, and, and it's true. The truth is, and he was and he really was a true Torah model leader. He was also a religious Zionist leader. And, and, and he was something, he was somebody who was, it was also very interesting that he was well respected, not only in the modern Orthodox community, he was also very well respected in the Haredi community. Very, very interesting. Very, very, I, I must on a personal note, will tell you about Rav Gadaya Dov. That when I was in the Kolo and while you studying to for after the regular smicha for the next extra, extra years to be a Dayan, a rabbinic judge, that I would often call Rav Gadaya Schwartz at home and I would ask him questions nonstop. And this wonderful rabbi, this wonderful gentleman, such a kind person, I think you could see that on his face as well. You could see the kindness, you see the content with himself. And and Rav Gadaya Do Schwartz, this this uh, this this little bit this nudnik uh, a rabbi, young rabbi, is calling him and asking him questions. I believe so. I'm asking him questions and questions and not nonstop questions. <laughs> and he, uh, he and he and he answered them. He 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 just nonstop. He he answered these. Uh, he he answered, he answered these questions. It was, it was it was not. He had so much patience. Never a complaint. And you know it's interesting that uh, a, a, a about uh, about six seven years ago, I was asked by the the, the Lakeville uh, Orthodox community of Anche Shalom ASBI. Some of you may from, may be familiar. They asked me to come and, and look over their Arabs. and I, I told Rabbi Walkenfeld that the only way that I'm going to come there is if I have permission from from Rabbi Schwartz. Because what right do I have? To say about it, to, to to comment on an A Rav in Chicago. He's the Maradasri, he's the great Rav of, of, of Chicago. And 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 Rav and Rav Gadaya Dov uh, told Rab, told Rabbi Rabbi Walkenfeld of Anche Shalom in, uh, in in Lakeview. And uh, well, that he said to him, I cherish he cherishes his relationship with me. So apparently, not only was he uh, was he not was he not irritated. He, he seems he genuinely appreciated how much concern. I think he loved the idea of the older rabbi uh, helping the younger rabbi, the older Diane, the experienced Diane, helping the younger rabbi uh, get his feet wet and, and learn how to be a Diane, learn how to be a rabbinic judge and how to be able to render halakhic decisions. I, I, I'm just so grateful to him that he, just like Rav Zalman Nechemia, was so generous with their time uh, with with me, it's uh, you know I don't think I could just call up you know if I was a, a a law school student I don't think I'd be able to call Supreme Court justice and be and keep him on the phone for uh, for for forty five minutes at a shot and pestering him with questions nonstop and answering me patiently I don't think that would happen but remember with Jews this is the overall theme of what I want to get across tonight great post great halachic decisors are not just about their legal brilliance. 
They're also about, about great human beings. Now, Rav Gedalia, though, was a very, very, very smart man. I'd like to share with you with uh, one controversial ruling and a challenge he received and how he responded. Now, Rav Gedalia, though, controversially endorsed the New York State Get Law of 1992, DRL, Domestic Relations Law 236. Now, Domestic Relations Law 253, for another, for another time, is, is very well accepted. But 236 was very, very controversial. And, uh, and in fact, two great gedolim in Eretz Yisrael, Rav Yashiv and Rosh Hashanah came out against it, and yet Rav G'day Yadov came out in four. Rav G'day Yadov, when he, when he assumed in 1992, we became the Av Basin for the, uh, for the Rabbinical Council of America. He flew to meet the then Sephardic chief rabbi and both chief rabbis, and he, met, and he, and he recounted I was meeting with, with, Rav, with Rav, Rav, the then Sephardic chief rabbi, Rav Bakshi Doron. Rav Bakshi Doron, or it might have been Rav, Rav Bakshi Doron. He asked Rav Bakshi Doron, whoa, whoa, what's going on over here? How, how, I hear you've endorsed the, uh, the New York State get law against Rav Yashiv and Rav Shomo Zaman Arbach. How do you do such a thing? So Rav Gadaya Schwartz, I just want to you'll grasp this one little story. will give will help you grasp his brilliance and how clever he was. You know what his response was? His response, his, he said, his, he asked Rav Bakshi Dara, well, how do you deal with your Aguna problems? So Rav Bakshi Dara answered, what we do is, is what we do, kfiya, kfiya, mizonot. what we do is, is we encourage the recalcitrant spouse to, the, with, with, uh, with, get, with, with loading them with spousal support. So Rav Gadaya Dov Schwartz says, it's, that's exactly what uh, DRL, Domestic Relations Law 236, is just saying, if you're not giving it yet, that the husband is going to have to pay, or perhaps even the wife as well, the, the husband will have to pay additional spousal support. It's exactly what you did. Argument over. And Gadai uh, and, uh, Shmores made his point that Mabakshi Doron was, uh, was convinced. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. I, I just, you can't, short story, but really, really captures, uh, really, really captures his, uh, his, his, his brilliance. Just, uh, Two last things that, uh, two last memories of Rav Gadai Yadov, such a special human being, such a special, wonderful human being. He told the, uh, he, remember I'm listening to a recording of a speech to RCA rabbis. I know Rabbi Morgenstern many times uh, would be at the RCA convention, to see, you know, at, uh, hearing Rav Gadai Yadov, inspiring words. I think the most inspiring thing was that he said, he said to the rabbis, hey, you rabbis, you have to look yourself and this is, I always think about this all the time. You have to look yourself in the mirror. Are you, are you, are you serving as the best possible role model for your congregants and your students? That's a very, I, I try to remember that all the time. I always try to bear that in mind. Am I being the best possible role model? Very powerful words, very powerful words from, from Rav Gudai. Finally, I just want to can, can share with you the last conversation that I had with uh, that I had with Rav Gadaya Dov, and this was in January of 2000, in 2016, and and he was well, it, it was a few months before his uh, be, before his uh, before his devastating stroke, and uh, and Rav Gadaya Dov, uh, I, I asked I had the following question I had a Kohen uh, who was uh, from whose family had not been observant for, for three generations, had not been Orthodox, had not been affiliated with an Orthodox congregation for three generations. No one in the male in the male line was affiliated with it with a with, with within the with with within the uh, within the Orthodox community. And he very much wanted to marry a very nice, very nice uh, uh, woman who was divorced. So we read in this week's parsh that Cardinal not allowed to marry a divorcee. So is there any het there here? So I remember, I, I had heard that, that uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein had approved such a situation that this, since he came from a family of generations, many dec many decades, almost a century of non-affiliation, of not being affiliated with an Orthodox congregation, not being, not, not Shmir Shabbos, not Shmir Kashras, and that he would be permitted to, uh, to, to marry a Grusha because there's no Nehmanus, there's no halacha credibility to establish that he's a Kohen. How do you know he's a Kohen? You need to hear from somebody that observes the, rule, the rules of Kahuna, that in a, he's accepted in a community, in an Orthodox community, that as, as a Kohen. But he had been recognized, it had been muksak, didn't have an, it established an ident, a, a, a Kohen identity in an Orthodox community. His family had not 
the line in, in, in nearly a century. Rogadaya Dov said that, they, that it was permissible for me to be the Masada Kedushin. I was Masada Kedushin. And just a few months ago, they had their third child. Not beautiful, not beautiful. But I, of course, I can't say who it is because it's private. So that's like with, with, so, many, with so many stories with, uh, with, 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 with Rav Gadaya Dov. Beautiful, beautiful. But the last thing I want to end off with about Rav Gadaya Dov is that uh, the, I asked him at that point, I was, with, I was standing with my, my older son, Binyamin, and I asked him to give a bracha. And, uh, and he gave my son a, 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 a bracha. I asked my son, what did he tell you? So he said, he should be a Talmud Chacham, be a Torah scholar, should bring nachas to your parents. And most important, he said, most important, midos tovos. You should have good attributes, good personality, proper, proper behavior, proper comportment. You know, it's the most important thing to develop, work on your midos tovos. That's what he, that's what he emphasized. Beautiful. Just, just beautiful words from a beautiful person. It's just, uh, I, I hope, I, I hope I did a little bit of justice to uh, to these two beautiful people. And now for our concluding last beautiful person that I wanted to that I wanted to share, I wanted to, sh- to talk about, and that is Rav David Feinstein. I want to share with you this little uh, this little video, a little snippet of this video uh, where he's being asked about the bracha on a wrap. And uh, I, I hope you'll find this, uh, you know, again, let's see again if we can, you can grasp the personality of, of Rav David from this, uh, from the, from the snippets. Okay, here we go. Let's, let's go to, let, let me just bring this up. Okay, hold on one second. Let me just bring it up. And here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Share screen. I got the sound on and. Let me just up the sound to make sure that you hear it properly. Okay, here we go. Here we go. This is from uh, 2016. He is about 85 at this point. Different sizes. These are obviously fake. It's a piece of bread. But Rebbe, nobody would eat this without putting in tuna fish or egg salad. Yeah, that's what he does. Right, but just plain, nobody's going to eat this. So what's it got to do with it? I wouldn't eat bread plain either. I'd put <laughs> no, salt but on it. Right? Let me, let me okay. see what happens here. Aspamela. I don't know. Ready to soak. Flour. Okay. So uh, I see something on the chat. We have a chat. So what do we? What do we? What are, any any thoughts of uh, any thoughts about um, about about what did you think from those thirty seconds of Rav David Feinstein? What are you? Well, what's your impression of Rav David Feinstein? Right, he's cheerful. Right, a sense of humor. That's right. That's right. Clever. He came up with a witty response uh, right away. Matter of fact. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Anything? Uh, any, any other? Any other thoughts? Any other thoughts? You know what struck me as uh, was that uh, how quick he came to his decision. Now, uh, if you if you learned in yeshiva and you if you learn mesechus brachos and you learned about the topic of trying to do the six parak of brachos and trying to defend uh, to try to define what exactly is bread, that's a that's a big topic. You can get and keep you busy for a long time. Many weeks in a uh, will occupy a yeshiva t- a yeshiva student's uh, time trying to define properly define what exactly bread what precisely bread is. He one second and you notice by the way that he was asked questions and they were pounding him with questions. You can go back to this video. He's pounding, pounding, pounding with questions, and he was he was resolute. He was res- he was kind about it. He was very smiley about it, but he was very confident, very resolute. Like we said about Rav Zalman Chemi Rav Gedayadov, very comfortable with themselves. Very, very comfortable with themselves. Now, I think to me that that is, uh, that's really the most remarkable thing of Rav David Feinstein. Now, Rav David Feinstein, of course, is the son of Rav Moshe Feinstein. Now, can you imagine the, the, um, the, the, the pressure Growing up, being the son of of Rav Moshe Feinstein, Rav Moshe Feinstein is the is is a gadol. Rav Moshe Feinstein, who, who died in 1986, was a gadol of unbelievable magnitude. 
He, he's probably not just, he wasn't just great in his generation. He, he was one of the top 10 rabbis, I would dare say, in the, in the last two, 300 years. So I'm just oh, incredible. And this is how Rabbi David Feinstein uh, grows up with that. Now, that's a lot of pressure. That's, that's an awful lot of pressure to, to, to grow up with that. Is he, can, is he uh, now, Rabbi David Feinstein was a very great rub, but not on the level of, of, of his father. Did he seem to, did that seem to bother him one bit? No. Did he, uh, did he try to imitate his father? No, he honored him a tremendous. Did he try to, did he try, did he put out a book called Igros David? You know, we have Igros Moshe, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein's response. Did he put out an Igros David? Not an Igros, a Divros David, like his, his father's uh, writings on, 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 on the Gemara? No. He put out his a safe for this Talmud and collected on of, of his drushos and and, uh, and 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 his commentary on the Agada. That's pretty much that's his uh, that's what he put out. Those are the books that he put out. He wasn't trying to be his. He knew he's not his father, and you know what? He was very comfortable with himself that he wasn't that he that he wasn't his father. Uh, it, it just uh, I, the mental the mental health, the psychological health of, of these of these great rabbinim. I would say that to be a gadol without you, you psychological health is, is 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 essential. Without that psychological health, I, I just don't see how they would uh, be able to, to be able to achieve what they did to be great, great halachic minds, but also great, great halachic uh, and great people. With really, as Rav Gadai Yadov said, with, with Midos, so with Midos Tovos. Uh, I didn't have that many interactions with uh, Rav David Feinstein. I had about four or five interactions with him. Rav Gadai Yadov, uh, many, Rav Zam Lechemi, uh, many, many, dozens with Rav Gadai Yadov and, and Rav Zam Lechemi. But we're with, uh, with, with Rav David Feinstein, there's five, five interactions. I want to share with you one that I didn't put in the article that I, had, that I had in the link. And this was at a wedding, maybe some of you know him. Actually, the wedding took place in Westchester. Uh, not too far. I think it, I think it took a place in Rye, and uh, there was a, it was a wedding of Penny and Dana Becker, uh, and uh, Penny was my uh, student at TABC many years ago, and uh, beautiful wedding. And uh, and Dana's uh, parents uh, have a relationship with the uh, with the Feinstein's, and the two brothers were there, Rav David Feinstein and uh, and Rav Ruben Feinstein. When I walked into the wedding and I saw them sitting there, I'm like, you know, to me, I was like, I'm, uh, I'm dancing a jig. I was like, whoa, this is great. And they were just, they're just sitting there. I was like, okay, here we go. You know, so of course, question time. So I started, I started, uh, I, and I asked them, if, right, right off the bat, they're sitting there at the Hassan's tish, and I, you know, I, some of you may be rolling their eyes, but what, what, what's, on my, what's on my mind to, to ask them? So, you know, in the capacity as, uh, as working with the basin of Elizabeth, a lot of times I, 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 am, I am approached with questions of, of people who were uh, of, of Mamzeira's questions or Egan questions. Of course, I always pass them on to Gadai Yado, but, and, and also I, 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 I've also rubbed of it actually uh, in, 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 some, in some occasions. Uh, I'm out of the level to pass in such, such serious uh, issues myself. But I, I, I provide the raw material to the uh, to the top postkin for these for these very very serious issues. So so I had just read it in a in a tshuva and a response by Rav Shlomo Amar himself, a very interesting, uh, wonderful per, wonderful person. Uh, and Rav, Rav Amar wrote in in, in in a tshuva that that he understood that Rav Moshe Feinstein believed that you can assume that any non orthodox wedding was invalid. In other words, why why are you uh, now, why is this important for me to know? It's because let's say if a woman's not uh, is having a hard time getting a get, or uh, a woman remarried without a get, and then and they had children from the second marriage, but the first marriage was it was conducted by a non orthodox rabbi. So, Ramosha Feinstein famously ruled in many of these cases that the marriages weren't valid. So, Rav Amar, as I understood him, seemed to interpret Rav, Rav Moshe as saying that oh, now you can presume it's a chazaka that they uh, they weren't done properly. I asked, uh, I, I asked both of them, I had both of them together at this, at this occasion, and I asked them, is this an accurate presentation of their father's view? So first of all, for, for a very beautiful part of what happened over here was that when I posed this question, I posed them both to Rav Ruben and to Rav David. And Rav Ruben, immediately, the younger brother, uh, immediately pointed and he said, he pointed to his brother and he said, 
this is to my brother to answer the question to answer the question. Rav Ruven, he we Balachaim Aruki, which should live for many long years. Rav Ruven, another beautiful personality, tremendous respect for his brother. Tremendous respect for his brother. He's not going to speak. He's not going to speak in, in in the presence of his brother. Let his bro, let let my let say he said let my brother answer the question. And Rav, Rav, Rav David said, now before you issue a ruling, you have to very very careful carefully examine every single case. You cannot make that presumption. Maybe there were two Orthodox Adam at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a wedding and, uh, and uh, therefore at a conservative wedding, and that would make the marriage valid. You had two Shomer Shabbos adult males uh, watching the giving the ring. And in fact, this past spring, I was just confronted with a situation like this. The husband wasn't, wasn't giving the get, and it, said, and, I, and it was a conservative marriage. We did the investigation. Lo and behold, there were two Orthodox adult men that witnessed the delivery of the ring, and I, I, I we couldn't find a heter for her. Very, very, uh, you know. Again, I have to be. I want to help people, but I have to be honest. I have to be. I have to do it in the right way. And Rav David and Rav Ruvain taught me how to taught me how to do it. And when Rav David was saying this, Rav Ruvain was shaking his head. He was nodding his head in approval, and uh, and it was just it was just. I, more than just the ruling is the fact they were open to this. They didn't say, "Who are you? What do what you? What do what you? What are you bothering me at, at a wedding to ask a question about like this?" So they were they were very very cordial. They were very it was beautiful to see the, the kavod that the younger brother had for the older brother. Just to, just to see again, it's not just the the brilliance. It's also the uh, it, it, it's it's also the uh it's also the beautiful personality that's involved i just wanted to share one other reminiscence of my first interaction with rav david feinstein i happened to be spend the shabbos in june of 1989 in the lower east side so i say you know what i'm in the lower east side the money uh let's take advantage let's i want to meet rav, rav david feinstein so I, I i i walked over with the people i was staying i walked over to uh to the uh to yeshiva and shabbos afternoon i walked over to mtj and uh, and and I walked over to the yeshiva, and uh, and I came into the yeshiva. Not too many people in the yeshiva in the afternoon. There's Rav David Feinstein sitting happily. He's learning Ovos Rabbi Nassan. It's a, a summer afternoon, reading, learning Ovos Rabbi Nassan. He looked very deep in thought, but he looked very very happy, very very content, learning. And I asked I asked him I asked him if it would be okay if I would ask him questions, and I asked him. I asked him a whole, whole, whole battery of questions. Now it impacts, I asked him a question specifically at that time when I, I, in 1989, I just became very interested in building airs. I made my first air in the community that I, that I grew up in. And I had a whole battery of questions to ask him. And uh, and, and, Rabbi, and, <laughs> and uh, you'll very much appreciate what, what, uh, what Rabbi Morgan said, Rabbi Klinger, will very, very much appreciate the question that I asked him. I asked him about Tuchel. When the wire bolts through a pole, is that acceptable? I love to rely on that in an Arab because it makes the Arab much more efficient, makes uh, makes the checking much more efficient, the maintenance much more efficient. It's beautiful, but it's somewhat controversial. Rav Shecht and Rav Willig accept it. And I wanted to make sure that I, if I make an Arab, that I knew others didn't necessarily accept it. The Mr. Bro wasn't so sure about it. So I asked Rav David Feinstein straight out, what is what what do you and your father a little bold to ask this what do you and your father believe about Tacho? he said well look i believe that baseline halacha mikradin it's permissible and but i just don't think that it's proper to for a community to make an a roof with Tacho since the uh, since the mishabura is not sure if it's okay now i want to be straight out in the in the in, in, in almost all the communities that I help make an area of including maintain an area of including the one in my community here in Tinek, we rely on Tachov. We follow our postkin Rav 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 Willig. I never uh, I never uh, had a chance to speak to Rav Gedalia Do Schwartz about this, but the, Rav Shechter and Rav Willig approved it, and and I and I and, and and this is what we do in the practice in our community. But I didn't want to make a, an area that would be. Invalid according to baseline opinion, according to according to Moshe Feinstein, and and he, and he reassured me. He said, "I do not consider the air to be invalid," and uh, so that was a very important rule. Again, Rav David Feinstein, and we and we do we rely on this in Scarsdale. We rely on this in Scarsdale. We rely on this in White Plains, and 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 uh, and the the neighboring White Plains area. 
it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a it is literally a game changing ruling and i never would have relied on it had i had i not been reassured from Rav david himself that that Rav Moshe feinstein actually uh actually baseline halacha does approve of it so that's a uh that that's a very uh that that was that was you know one tangible very tangible impact that he has on on young Israel of of of, of Scarsdale. I would be remiss if I did not mention, and I didn't mention the article, but I should mention it tonight. And 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 and, and that is that Rav David Feinstein, the tremendous love that the from from Jews from the Lower East Side have for him. You speak to anyone from the Lower East Side, the tremendous love and respect and fierce loyalty to his rulings. If Doug Feinstein gave up sock, the East Sider, yeah, they're, they're not deviating from him. There's tremendous love, tremendous love and fierce loyalty that uh, Rav David had for the community and the community reciprocated and, sh- and, and showed him. Tremendous, tremendous, really tremendous love, a real cornerstone of the community, a pillar, the pillar of the, of the Lower East Side community. And, and he's really reciprocated with, uh, with, 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 the, with the love from the community. I want to end off. I want to end off with, with something about, uh, about all three, a perspective on all three rabbis and a perspective going ahead. And I remember this was a subway, ba- subway ride back to YU in 1986, in March 1986, when I attended, uh, along with uh, many, many people, uh, with tens of thousands of people, I attended the funeral, the Leviah of Rav Moshe Feinstein. And I remember on the way back, 1980, we're riding back from Lower East Side to uh, to YU, and, uh, and and I was working with friends. We're walking up the uh, that, that hill, and uh, the big the big hill in Washington Heights, and uh, and and I, and I was saying to my friends, now what are we going to do? We had Rav Moshe Feinstein for uh, for all these decades. He solved the most difficult questions that we have. Now what do we, we're lost. What are we going to do without without uh, with, without Rav Moshe Feinstein? So uh, one, you know, is an older rabbi that was uh, that was that was uh, alongside or overheard me say that. And he said, "Don't worry. Hashem provides the great gedolim of for each generation. Each generation, we it will have the poskim, the halachic decisors that they need. And clearly, from uh, fr- from from 1986." To, uh, to 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 this year when unfortunately they passed away, Rav Rav Zalman Goldberg in Eretz Yisrael and his impact in the United States as well. Rav Gedaliyado Schwartz, Rav David Feinstein, they provided us. They will they provided us with the, with with the, with the rulings. Maybe not as great as as Rav Moshe Feinstein, but they were exactly what what we needed. Hashem sent the perfect people at the perfect time. They 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 and they met our needs perfectly. And now, so you'll ask now in 2021, what are we going to do without uh, with, without Rav Schwartz, without Rav Zalman Lechem, without Rav David? What are we going to do? What are we going to do without them? But you know what? Hashem provides each generation with the with the Rabbanim that we need, and uh, God willing, we should reconvene for for uh, for, uh, for for a happy occasion, not to uh, to give eulogies on people who passed away. We should we should meet. God willing, we should all be healthy in, 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 in 30 years from now. And I think you'll see that, uh, that this will reflect and say, you know, even though we, we lost Rav Gadaya Dov, we lost Rav, Rav David, we lost, uh, we, we, we lost Rav Zalman Chemia, you know, Hashem still provides the perfect people for, uh, for each generation. Thank, I want to thank, again, I want to thank Rabbi Morgenstern, Rabbi Klinger. I want to thank, thank Steve. I want to thank all of you for coming. It's a, it's a great, great honor to, uh, to, to join with my uh, with my friends at the Younger Zero Scarsdale. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi Jackter, <clears throat> for the perspective on those three uh, important gadolim that unfortunately we lost over the past year. And uh, you know, you spoke tonight about about the most important thing is is the uh, is the midot tovot of those rabbanim, and I can certainly that um, uh, in my uh, knowing Rabbi Jackter now for many years. That is exactly the type of rav and posik that our Jactor is uh, is one with midot to vote, and so it's uh, it's our pleasure to have had you tonight in our community for so many reasons, uh, but just in and of itself because of your midot to vote. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Thank you, Rabbi Jactor, and uh, please uh, everyone join us next week. We'll be having uh, Rabbi Mark Drach. Uh, we'll be speaking 
um, about uh, Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb's father-in-law um, and the legacy uh, of Rabbi Lamb as we are approaching the, uh, the first yard site of uh, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Lamb, Zechron Libracha. Please join us then, eight o'clock next week. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Rav.